Well, hello everybody, Mike Prevost from MikePrevost.com here. Today's topic is training endurance athletes. And what I'm going to go over with you today is training for two uh, different scenarios or two different situations. One is training simply for health and the other is training for performance. And although there's a lot of overlap between the two, uh, depending on our focus, we'll change the way we program. Um, I'm going to go over a basic template today. This is a basic periodized template that forms the basis of all good endurance training programs. So if you peel back the layers of any endurance training program <clears throat> for basically any sport, whether it's cycling, running, cross country skiing, it looks like this basic template with some modifications. So the template we're going to go through today is most appropriate for non-elites. And by elites, I mean people competing on the national and international level. Um, this program would work just fine for elites with small modifications. Elites tend to need a little bit more intensity sprinkled throughout their training program. But uh, this basic formulation will give you a pretty good overall understanding of how to write endurance training programs and uh, an ability to understand endurance training programming uh, across the board pretty much. Um, so uh, I'm going to go over some physiological adaptations and a lot of details. In some cases, I oversimplify a little bit, but uh, this level of detail is all we need to really understand the basics. Okay, let's get started. So I want to start our discussion with an understanding of training and racing zones. Okay, so these are uh, training zones from the Norwegian Olympic Federation. I, I like these particular training zones and I use them a lot with athletes. Uh, just about any training zone system will work, but I think this is a well thought out, simple training zone system that, that works particularly well. And you notice in this system, there are five zones, zones one through five. And we use a couple of ways to determine whether we're training in that zone. One is as a percentage of max heart rate, and the other is perception of effort. And um, we really uh, use both of these things. So for example, zone two is 72 to 82% of your maximum heart rate. Um, and I'll talk about max heart rate in a little bit. And what it should feel like perception wise is easy to steady. So at the lower end of that zone, it should feel easy. At the upper end of that zone, it should feel steady. If I asked you, you know, how does this feel? Is this, is this uh, easy? Well, it's not really easy. Is it hard? No, it's definitely not hard. It's steady. This is sort of like um, long run pace. If you're going out for a nice long run, um, and you know, you're not going to be suffering the whole run. You're going to just have a nice, steady, enjoyable run. That's that pace. Okay. And off to the right, we have race distance uh, at that zone pace. That means um, what race distance is uh, competed at that particular zone pace effort. So you can see for zone two, that's marathon pace. So for most people, that's a pace that they can sustain for three hours or more because uh, that's about how long most people would take to run a marathon. So now you see basically the construction of this zone. And in our simple template, and in fact, in most endurance training programming, we're really going to only use three of these zones. And you can see from the box here at the bottom, we're going to use zone two, four, and five. That's it. And this is a, a bit of what's called a polarized training model, where we do most of our training at in zone two, with a sprinkling of zone four and zone five, and we mostly stay out of zone three. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, zone three is still fairly intense training, um, but you can put in a lot of volume at zone three. It's not really hard enough to get most of the adaptations we want in zone four or five, and it's not easy enough to allow us to accumulate a lot of volume like zone two. So we get all we need basically by training in zone two, four, and five. It's really the only tools we need for any race distance pretty much. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so those are our tools. Zone two, we usually call steady pace runs. Zone four, we call tempo uh, runs. And zone five, we call VO2 max intervals or intervals or track intervals. So I'll make a simple recommendation here. Just buy yourself a simple, simple heart rate monitor. It'll be enormously effective for making sure that you're staying in the right training zone and getting the right training effect. Um, I, I would not recommend a wrist mounted type right now. 
um, the optical sensor wrist mounted type they're just not accurate enough to uh, really track heart rate during exercise activity they're okay at rest but not during exercise the exception is the Skosh Rhythm, and the reason the Skosh Rhythm is a little bit better is it's got a nice optical sensor, but it also can be moved away from the wrist and more on the forearm, which is a much more suitable location for an optical-based heart rate monitor. So the Skosh Rhythm is just fine. All of the other wrist-mounted systems are just not there. They're not, they're not accurate enough for our purposes. Um, the chest type is nice because it detects electrical activity and can also be used as a tool to measure heart rate variability, which I may talk about in another uh, lecture, what, what is heart rate variability, but it's something else you can use. But highly recommend getting a simple heart rate monitor to help you stay on track with this program. Well, I gave you a sample training zone uh, system based on percentage of maximum heart rate and recommended that you buy a heart rate monitor. So how do you know your max heart rate? Well, there's several ways to determine max heart rate. And here's what I recommend in order from most highly recommended way or the most accurate way to the least accurate way. Well, you know, of course, the most accurate way is to go to a lab and get a VO2 max test done along with heart rate monitoring. And that way somebody's looking at your heart rate to make sure it's not an anomalous spike and we're looking for the highest heart rate that you achieve. And we can also determine that you, in fact, did achieve VO2 max. So that's the most accurate way. If you got a VO2 max test, we can look for that max heart rate. And that's, that's a great way to do it. But I understand not everybody has access to that. So you can do a simulated VO2 max test, and it's best if you have a partner, and this is done very easily on a treadmill. And the reason you want a partner is you want somebody watching the heart rate monitor the whole time and operating the treadmill for you. That way you're not looking at the heart rate monitor while you're running, and that way they can look for an anomalous spike. You know, if they suddenly see 220 beats per minute, but then it sort of settles back down to a normal range, you know, that was just an, an oddball spike. And the way you do this is, um, you know, get a get a nice easy 10 minute warm up, and then you can set the treadmill at anywhere from a one to a three percent grade, and start at about four and a half miles per hour, and then increase the speed every minute until you can't go anymore. Um, you know, it's best if you have a little bit of treadmill running experience before you give it a shot, and you want to go till absolute exhaustion, until you're having to grab onto the rails and straddle the treadmill. And you're looking for the highest heart rate that you achieve during that test. And it's going to be right at the end, pretty much. Um, for fast runners, you want to increase the speed by one mile an hour every minute. For, you know, novice or, or uh, not really fast runners, you want to increase it by about a half a mile an hour every minute. And you can just leave the grade at what it is, anywhere between 1% and 3%. It doesn't really matter. We're just looking to get your heart rate up to max. Of course, before any max testing, you want to make sure that you're healthy and cleared by a doctor to do so. So that's also a very good way to determine max heart rate, and it's the highest heart rate you see during that test. Another simple way to do it is a maximum mile run or a mile and a half run, mile to a mile and a half run with a sprint finish, as long as you have a strong sprint finish at the end. And then you want to check your heart rate immediately. As soon as you cross the line, you want to check your heart rate. And you're going to be very, very close to max heart rate at that point. If you normally train with a heart rate monitor and you record your heart rate and maybe download it to a program, software program, something like that, you can take a look at your archives and look for the highest value on a max effort, effort hill repeat if you're doing some hill running, that kind of thing. And that's going to probably be pretty close if it was a really good hard max effort. Uh, that'll get you probably within five or so beats per minute from your max heart rate. The other thing is if you are using a heart rate monitor regularly and you're doing mixed effort training, some hard efforts, some easier efforts, um, you can look for the highest value you observe during training. And that may get you close, but it just depends on how much intensity you're putting into your training. And, you know, unfortunately, probably the most inaccurate way to determine max heart rate is any of the prediction formulas. None of them are really any good. The most commonly, one, commonly used one is 220 minus your age in years. So a 20-year-old would have a predicted max heart rate of 200, for example. Well, you know, the standard or the average error for that estimate is about 8 to 9 beats per minute. That means the for the average person, it's going to be incorrect by 8 to 9 beats per minute. And that's a pretty significant amount. So if you've got nothing else to go on, you know, and you, you're just buying a heart rate monitor, go with the 220 minus age estimate at first until you have time to try one of these other methods. But once you have a more accurate estimate, then you can go in and set up your own heart rate training zones based on the percentages we shared earlier. 
And then using a simple heart rate monitor, you can go in and uh, make, make sure that you're training in the right zone. Okay, so this, this presentation is going to be sort of a split, you know. In the first portion, we're going to talk about training for health. And in the second portion, we're going to talk about training for performance. Now, understand that there's a lot of overlap between the two. If you're training for performance, you're getting lots of health benefits. If you're training for health, you're getting lots of performance benefits. But, you know, if we want to be optimal with our training, um, then uh, it's a different way to look at training and a different way to program. So, you know, basically training for health, we're going to follow the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines, which are research-based guidelines that have uh, taken into consideration decades of research on the effects of aerobic exercise on health. And for training for performance, you know, we're going to use a basic periodized model. That's the foundation for all good endurance training programs. And we're going to use a stripped down model called the three tools, three phases approach. You know, again, training elite athletes is a bit different. And so we're not going to really consider in this presentation training elite athletes, although it's not that different. So here's the basic recommendation for training for health. Okay, so if you're not concerned with performance, running a 5K, getting, a bet, getting better at running the mile, that kind of thing, and if you're just doing aerobic exercise for health, this is all you need really, and it doesn't need to get any more complex than this. And so these are minimum recommendations by the American College of Sports Medicine and lots of other health type organizations have uh, made these same recommendations. So they give you an either or. So either 150 minutes per week of moderate intense exercise, and that can be split into several sessions. So, you know, you can do 10, 15, 20 minutes a day to accumulate a total of 150 minutes per week. Okay, and it's done at a moderate intensity, which is basically our zone one. Now, if you were doing a workout in this intensity zone, you would probably call it easy and not moderate. So that's just a definitional thing. This is what ACSM calls moderate, but you would probably describe it as very easy. It's 60 to 72% max heart rate. It's easy. It's like a brisk walk pace. So if you're walking at three to four miles per hour, which is, you know, an intentional walk pace, but it's not a super fast walk pace. It's, it's a brisk walk pace. That would be moderate. And the recommendation is 150 minutes per week or more at a moderate intensity. Okay. Or, and this is an either or, okay. The other option is 75 minutes a week or more of vigorous intense intensity exercise. And in this case, vigorous is our zone two. It's 72 to 82 percent max heart rate. And you would call that, you know, easy-ish to steady. OK, and but the ACSM defines that as vigorous. For most people, that would be like a slow jog, a nice, easy, easy, slow jog. OK, so those are either ors. You don't have to do both. The idea is to get at least um, 150 moderate or 75 minutes vigorous or combination of the two. And in general, in terms of what the research says for health benefits, more than that is better. But most of the benefits are gained by going from nothing to these recommendations. Does that make sense? Going from nothing to 150 minutes a week of moderate or from nothing to 75 minutes a week of vigorous gets you most of the uh, benefits. But if you do add more on top of that, you do get additional benefits. Um, and what the research shows is that these recommendations can be done in blocks as small as 10 minutes and still have the same type of health impact. So if you were going to do vigorous, intense activity, for example, that would be you know, just a little more than seven sessions of 10 minutes each. So you, literally, you know, that could be 10 minutes of easy jogging um, every day or just a hair over 10 minutes of easy jogging every day to meet those ACSM guidelines. So it's not a lot of volume necessary to get the most bang for the buck. Again, this is training for health and not performance. But for health, this is all you need. We don't need to get any more complex than this. Stay in the right heart rate zone and accumulate the time. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about training for performance. And of course, you're going to get some health benefits in training for performance because we're going to encompass those ACSM goals in our performance training. But it's going to get just slightly more complex, but not really. And, and we'll include a little bit more volume because we're trying to optimize performance. And this is going to be what I call the three tools, three phases approach. And it's, it's a stripped down version of basic run periodization training that's used by just about everybody. 
So we're really going to use only three tools in this approach. So if you remember back to our training zones, um, in our approach, we're going to use three of those training zones. We're going to use zone two, which we're going to call steady running. We're going to use zone four, which I'll call tempo and zone five, which we'll call intervals. Those are, remember the VO2 max intervals are the high intensity intervals. So those three tools. And we're going to have three phases and we'll explain what the phases are in a minute, but our phases, you know, really simply are just base, a base building phase, a building phase and a peaking phase. So that's it. Three tools, three phases. So I want to describe the three tools first and then the three phases and then we'll put it all together. So this is tool number one. This is steady pace running. And remember, uh, our steady pace running is zone two. And that's basically it. And in our steady pace runs, all we're doing is we're going out and we're running for a, a given amount of time in a zone two heart rate. That's it. 72 to 82 percent max heart rate. And uh, that's all we ever do during this tool is we just run at a pace that keeps our heart rate in that zone. There's, you know, no intervals, no trying to run harder. We just continue to run in that zone. Um, these would be medium to long steady runs at a constant effort. So the idea is to maintain a constant effort. And a constant effort just means staying at zone two heart rate. You know, so what are the adaptations that happen during this type of running? If I just run at a zone two heart rate and I continue to accumulate mileage at zone two, what happens physiologically? Well, let's take a look at short term and long term adaptations. So something kind of interesting happens. Um, let's look at four months of training. At four months of training, we see a 10 percent improvement in cardiac output but not a big improvement in oxygen extraction. Oxygen extraction is oxygen extraction down at the muscle level. And that depends on capillary density and also all uh, high concentration of aerobic enzymes that are responsible for aerobic metabolism. And those enzymes are in the mitochondria. So we might say high mitochondrial density. So the first four months of training, most of the improvements are due to cardiac output and primarily improved stroke volume, the amount of blood your heart uh, pumps per beat is improved um, with a little bit of improvement in oxygen extraction. But long term, if we continue training in that zone two, we'll see that cardiac output, you know, it improves a little bit more. You know, we, we go from a 10% improvement to a 15% improvement, but we see a big improvement in oxygen extraction. So it takes a long time to maximize the oxygen extraction part. And that probably should make sense because oxygen extraction, improving oxygen extraction involves building structures. We're literally building new capillaries to supply more blood flow and we're building more mitochondria, the little uh, organelles that are the energy producing factories of the cell. So it takes a while. Um, so one of the interesting things about this zone two training is that you know, benefits take a long time to plateau. As long as we're doing zone two training, we're probably seeing some benefits. Well, here's another benefit of zone two training that's really interesting. And we normally call this run economy or how much it costs your body energy wise to run a given distance. And the way we measure this, and I've measured it many times in the lab, is we measure oxygen consumption in milliliters per kilogram per kilometer. You know, I want to find out how much oxygen it requires for you to run a kilometer, basically. And, um, you know, oxygen consumption is directly related to energy expenditure. So if you use less oxygen, you're using less energy, and that means it's less taxing on your body. And so that equals in increased fitness. And this is a graph of notionally what it looks like between untrained, good, sub-elite, and elite. And you can see the elite have the lowest energy cost of running. That means it costs them less energy to run. And that's actually a good thing because it means that at their max capacity, they can run faster and faster because it costs less energy. And so that's one thing that improves with run training. And this takes a long time, years literally before it plateaus, years and years and years. And so this is an ability that's trained with zone two running. And so it's another ability like that oxygen extraction that will continue to improve year after year with more zone two training. 
So we're starting to get a picture that zone two training is something that, um, you know, you're just not, the benefits are just not going to plateau for years and years and years. And so the more of it you do, the better. So another thing that really adapts um, quite dramatically with zone two training is fuel use at a constant pace. So let's say at a zone two pace, or let's say at, uh, I don't know, uh, six miles an hour. So if we run at six miles an hour as a beginner, our fuel use might look like this first bar graph here where we see that, you know, we're using uh, um, the uh, fat is in the blue bars, carbohydrates in the red bars. So initially at six miles an hour, you know, we may be getting somewhere around 20% of our energy from fat and the rest from carbohydrates. But as we continue to train in zone two and improve, improve our ability to use fat, you know, by six months, we may be at 50% fat utilization and only 50% carbohydrates. But then after two years of training, we become really, really good. So at two years of training at that same six miles per hour, we may be up around 80 or 90% of our energy coming from fat. So it's another adaptation that takes a long time to maximize, but it's another beneficial adaptation that we get from zone two running or steady pace running. Well, in a previous lecture, I talked about high intensity interval training and uh, exercise intensity and fuel use. And if you haven't seen that one, go back and look at it. I think you'll learn something from it. But this is a slide from that presentation. And, you know, what I want you to notice in this slide is, uh, in this case, fat is the blue bars and carbohydrates are the red bars. As exercise intensity goes up, so this is percent max heart rate on this axis. This is percent fuel use on this axis. As exercise intensity goes up, fat utilization goes down. And just the opposite happens with carbohydrate utilization. As exercise intensity goes up, carbohydrate utilization goes up. So we discussed that in the previous uh, lecture, and you might want to go back and take a look at it. But at some point, we reach, um, we reach a point called the fuel crossover, uh, the fuel crossover point right here. And that's when we hit uh, a fat and carbohydrate utilization of 50-50. That's a fuel crossover point. Normally, a fuel crossover point's right in zone two. So when we start training in zone two, we tend to push that fuel crossover point to the right. And that's a great adaptation because we can rely more on body fat than on stored carbohydrates. And an interesting thing you might not know, you have enough stored carbohydrates in your body for maybe two hours of running at most, but you've got enough stored fat for hours and hours and hours of running. You know, you, you could run from New York to Miami um, easily with the amount of stored fat you have on your body. You've got enough energy in the fat stores, um, even a really lean individual. So that adaptation is a really nice adaptation from steady pace running. Well, I want to talk a little bit about bang for the buck now with steady pace running. So now we're, you know, we're just talking about getting in zone two and just just running basically in zone two at a constant effort. Um, so a good question to ask would be, well, how much how much mileage do I need to do in zone two? You know, where how much is too much and how much is enough? Well, there's a lot of debate about this, and this hasn't been nailed down shut, and there's probably some individual differences based on your training status and probably on genetics, too. But we can make some general recommendations. And, um, you know, my experience and the experience of uh, many other coaches is that you most people tend to reach a point of diminishing returns at about maybe 60 miles per week, you know. Beyond 60 miles per week, there are more improvements, but they're very small. Now, for an elite athlete, that's really important because for an elite athlete, gaining even, you know, 15 seconds in a 10K race might be the difference between, you know, first place and 10th place. So even those small marginal gains beyond 60 miles a week might have an elite athlete running 120 miles per week. But, you know, for us sub-elites, maybe there's not a lot of reason to run you know, especially zone two training beyond 60 miles per week because the marginal gains from that point on are not quite as great. And I've sort of depicted that here for you. Um, this is improvement on this axis and this is miles per week on this axis. And look at what happens, you know, when we go from 10 miles per week to 35 miles per week, we see a certain amount of improvement. That's, that's pretty good. 
Okay, and that's you know that's uh, uh, that's basically uh, what is that a twenty mile uh, fifteen a twenty five mile jump in uh, um, mileage and run mileage. Now, if we add another twenty five miles to that, you know, and we go from thirty five to sixty, well, we see an improvement, but it's not quite as big as that first twenty five mile increase. If I add a third twenty five mile increase in there. <clears throat> you know, to get uh, up to 85 miles. Well, you know, the amount of improvement I get from that third 25 is very small compared to that first 25. And that's, you know, a point of diminishing returns. And so really, you know, you're going to see the biggest bang for the buck going from zero miles a week to, you know, 10 or 15 miles a week. And you're still going to see a pretty good improvement adding another 10 miles. By the time you hit 60 miles per week of steady or zone two paced running, you're not going to see a lot more increase. Um, the increase is going to be marginal. But again, for elites, that's important. Now, I'm not saying you need to run 60 miles per week in zone two. We're talking about a, a top end for, you know, pretty high level performance and sub elite 60 miles a week is enough to get there. So let's summarize these adaptations we get from steady paced running, running in zone two. We get increased cardiac output, in, which is primarily due to improved stroke volume. We get some increased mitochondrial density. We get better run economy. It costs us less energy to run. We get better fat burning, so we burn more fat at a given, at a given run speed. Um, one thing I didn't talk about a whole lot, but it's uh, zone two running is excellent for building run durability. So we get, uh, we get more durable uh, joints and ligaments and tendons, uh, and less uh, susceptible to run injury over time by spending more time in zone two. And we also get improved recovery. And except for the stroke volume part of these uh, adaptations, the rest of those benefits don't plateau for years and years and years. So we can spend a lot of time, a long duration, doing steady pace running and feel confident that we're going to continue to get uh, positive adaptations. Okay, let's talk about our second tool. So our second tool is tempo pace training, and this is normally done as intervals. And in this case, we're talking about zone four, or 88 to 92% of your max heart rate. And the perception of an effort would be hard. This is 10K race pace, so it's pretty... It's pretty hard pace. It's not maximum though. It's not all out for sure. And the way we would normally do this is five to 20 minute, uh, minute intervals at a zone four heart rate. So what do I mean by five to 20 minute intervals? So something like three to five, three, uh, three repetitions of five minute intervals. So we might do say five minutes at zone four and then maybe uh, a five minute easy run in between then another five minutes at zone four, then five minutes easy, then another five minutes at zone four, and then a five minute easy, right? So that would be three uh, five minute tempo sessions with easy in between, okay? Or you might do something like two times 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, normally the amount of time we spend in a continuous zone four effort is between five and 20 minutes, usually not shorter than five minutes, usually not longer than 20 minutes. Okay, and so it's done as an interval, interval block with easy, easy running in between. The easier, the better. You want to keep the easy stuff easy so the hard stuff can be hard. Well, let's talk about dose. You know, we talked about 60 miles a week with the um, zone two running. You know, what's a big dose? Well, you know, per workout, 10 minutes of tempo pace is a relatively small dose per workout. So if I did say two five minute tempo intervals with five minutes easy in between, that's a, that's a small dose of tempo. A pretty big dose of tempo is 40 minutes. And that, that's a pretty heavy dose of tempo. So let's say I was doing two times 20 minutes at tempo pace. So maybe, uh, you know, 10 minutes easy, 20 minutes tempo, five minutes easy, 20 minutes tempo, 10 minutes cool down. That's a tough, tough tempo workout and a heavy, heavy dose of tempo. Um, so now we're giving you a range, you know, 10 to 40 minutes, 10 being a, a, a very small dose of tempo and 40 minutes being a very big dose of tempo. And we just structure it as five, five to 20 minute uh, um, intervals. Well, let's look, let's look at some of the adaptations that happen 
with uh, tempo training, with zone four uh, interval type training. Well, zone four is normally done a little bit higher intensity than the lactate threshold. You know, here's our lactate threshold right here where lactate starts to really rise. Zone four is done a little bit higher than lactate threshold. Usually produces a lactate concentration of about four millimoles per liter. Okay. Um, but one thing zone four training or tempo training does do is it drives up the lactate threshold. It pushes it to a higher speed. So this is run speed down here and that's lactate concentration up here. So as we continue to train and train and train, and incorporate these tempo intervals, um, what we might find is that that lactate threshold has moved over and maybe now that lactate threshold is at nine miles per hour. So we're increasing our lactate threshold is one of the adaptations we'll see with tempo training. Well, tempo training is a hard enough intensity to start to recruit some of those big fast twitch motor units and, uh, and a lot of our intermediate uh, twitch motor units as well. So there's fast twitch, intermediate, and slow twitch. Well, what we start to see is a shift. Um, our fast twitch motor units uh, go from uh, 2x to 2a, which is basically becoming an intermediate motor unit. So they go from fast twitch to intermediate. So what does that mean? Well, that means that they become more fatigue resistant and they have a higher aerobic capacity. So we start to build more aerobic capacity in our big fast twitch motor units, they produce less lactate and they, they take a longer time to fatigue and they're more efficient. So all of those things happen. This is a transformation of fiber type due to tempo type training. That's one of the positive benefits. And we also see a continued increase in stroke volume and cardiac stroke volume. So we talked about the basic benefits from uh, from zone two training. Here's the, here's the summary of the basic benefits from zone four or tempo training. So increased speed at lactate threshold. We see the muscle fiber type shifts from fast to intermediate we just talked about. And a continued increase in cardiac output or stroke volume. Now, remember, you know, for steady pace runs, we said that those, those training benefits, they didn't plateau for years and years and years. But, you know, we don't have it nailed down exactly, but we tend to see the effects of tempo training plateauing somewhere around six to eight weeks. Sometimes it's a little longer, sometimes it's a little shorter. You know, it depends on how the program is structured and, and how much improvement the athlete can make um, genetically, you know. But, you know, six to eight weeks is where we start to see things or improvements start to slow down a little bit and we start to plateau. And that's going to become important in terms of how we structure the training program. Well, here's our third tool. This is called VO2 max intervals. Sometimes we just call them intervals or track intervals. And I'll talk about why we call them track intervals in a little bit. But this is zone five. And this is 93 all the way to 100% max heart rate. And the perception of effort is very hard. You know, this is your mile best race pace. So this is a, this is a pretty hard effort. Now, the simplest and most common way to do this is to use a measured distance like a track and we run these as quarter mile or half mile track intervals. Half mile is more commonly used distance and uh, it's I believe more effective than half mile intervals. So the way I would recommend doing these is as half mile track intervals, you know, period. Now notice on our, on our tempo training we were using time, we were using five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, to gauge the length of our intervals. In this case, we're using distance. And, uh, you know, I'm going to explain why in a minute. It'll become abundantly clear why we want to use distance in this case instead of time. Um, so we're going to focus on half mile track intervals for this uh, tool number three, or any kind of marked distance on the road works fine too. Okay. So let's talk about what's a heavy and a light dose per workout, because we talked about that for tempo intervals. Well, one mile total is a pretty light dose, so that would be two half mile intervals. And two miles total is a pretty heavy dose. There's not a lot of difference between a light dose and a heavy dose in terms of total mileage, but believe me, you know, the difference between one mile and two miles of half mile track intervals is pretty, you know, pretty severe because each one takes its toll. Now, how do we normally do these? Well, we normally do track intervals with um, a one to one or a one to two work to rest ratio. So what does that mean? 
Well, here's what it means. If it takes me three minutes to run the half mile, then I'll want to rest between three to six minutes before I run my next half mile. Okay, so that's a one to one or a one to two work to rest interval. Um, really simple. So you just time how long it takes you to run the half mile and you want to rest as long or longer, basically up to twice as long uh, if you need to. Um, you know, a good gauge of whether you went out too hard or, or you're doing these about right is if your last interval is as fast as your first interval, you're probably okay. If your last interval is slower than your first interval, then you probably went out a little bit too hard and need to scale it back a little bit next time, okay? So let's talk about heart rate steady state. So I'm standing on the start line of the track and I'm getting ready to start a, a track interval, a half mile track interval. As soon as I start running, my heart rate's gonna start increasing, okay? And I'm gonna go immediately from standing still to whatever pace I'm gonna be running. Let's say I'm running uh, a six minute mile pace. So I'm gonna run a half mile in three minutes. So I'm gonna accelerate to that pace within, you know, probably 15, 20 yards or so, and then I'm gonna hold that pace steady for a half mile, so three minutes. All right, so let's see what our heart rate's gonna do over that three minute period. Well, it's gonna slowly increase over that three minute period. It's not gonna immediately shoot up to the heart rate required to maintain that pace. It takes a little while for the heart rate to get up there. And so what happens is, you know, by the time we reach our three minutes, we're just starting to get to the point where the heart rate is gonna be steady in the right zone. You know, we're gonna finally get to the point where we're reaching heart rate steady state. And in fact, we might not quite be there yet. It might take another minute. So what does that mean? That means we really can't use heart rate to gauge intensity on these intervals because, you know, in the first minute, your heart rate's not gonna nearly be there yet. In the second minute, it's still not gonna be there yet. You don't necessarily need to run harder to get your heart rate where it needs to be. It's just physically impossible for it to jump from, you know, resting levels to interval levels, you know, instantly. It takes a few minutes. And so heart rate is a good gauge of intensity for our uh, steady pace runs for tool number one. And for tool number two, our tempo pace runs, it's also a good gauge because we're gonna be in that tempo zone for a minimum of five minutes, but probably closer to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that kind of thing. There's plenty of time to get our heart rate up there. But for these, by the time we get our heart rate up to the target zone, our you know, our interval's over. So we can't really gauge our intensity with heart rate. And that's why we normally run them on a marked track and record our times every time we do an interval. So we record all of our interval time so that when we come back the next time, we can try to maybe beat that time a little bit. And it's also why we use as a rule of thumb that the last interval should be as fast as the first interval. Because what normally happens is people go out too hard on the first interval, then the second interval is slower than the first and the third interval slower than the second and they get slower and slower and slower. Then you went out too hard. But if they're all pretty hard effort and your last one is as fast as your first one, then that's pretty good. You're doing it about right. So we have to use a marked, um, a marked distance and record pace just for this one tool. So what are the adaptations for hard interval training? Well, primarily we drive up our VO2 max. Okay, and VO2 max is a rate of oxygen consumption. Think of it as a fuel burn rate, and, but the fuel we're burning is oxygen. That's VO2. This is oxygen fuel use rate in liters per minute. So as exercise intensity increases, the amount of fuel we need to burn each minute goes up, and we can measure that using something called a metabolic cart. This is work rate here in watts, but it could be run speed as well. And, you know, we increase the work rate, and oxygen use goes up, we increase the work rate, and oxygen use goes up, we increase it, oxygen use goes up, and then we increase the work rate again, but oxygen use doesn't go up anymore, and that's because we've reached a limit. We've reached our body's maximum limit for using oxygen. We can increase the work rate, but we can't use any more oxygen, and that's called the VO2 max. When VO2 plateaus, that's our VO2 max. Now, you say, well, how can we increase the work rate if we can't you know, use more oxygen. Well, the difference is made up for with anaerobic metabolism, right? So our work rate does increase, but this amount is now made up for with anaerobic metabolism and not aerobic metabolism using oxygen. 
And so we see a large, large lactate production. All right, so one of the benefits of uh, this uh, tempo, I mean, this uh, interval training, track interval training, our, our third tool is an improvement in VO2 max. Okay, so a summary of adaptations for our third tool for track interval training is increased VO2 max, but we still continue to see an increase in cardiac output primary, primarily through stroke volume. Well, you know, how, how long do we have before these effects plateau? Well, in the case of interval training, we normally see improvements plateau in about three to five weeks. Literally, you start doing interval training and for the first three to five weeks, we see some rapid improvement and then improvements just plateau. We don't see much improvement beyond that for beyond that three to five weeks with interval training. And that's gonna inform how we set up our periodized program. Okay, so I wanna explain another concept because uh, those of you with an exercise physiology background might be scratching your head a little bit um, uh, about these uh, basic concepts. And, and this, is, uh, this is an important one to understand. Okay, so I've, you know, I've put here uh, notionally zone one, two, and three. Okay, and in zone two, we said, for example, that, you know, one of the improvements you get in zone two is improved fat burning. Okay, so let's say that black line represents improvement in fat burning in that zone when we train in that zone. Well, you know, the thing you should uh, notice with the shape of this line is that you get some benefits in zone one and zone two also. And so what I'm trying to show here is that there's a lot of overlap, that it's not stovepiped and that when you train in zone two, you don't see any zone three improvements or any zone one improvements or that when you train in zone one, you don't get some of the improvements that you get from zone two training, or if you train in zone three, that you don't get some of the benefits that you get in zone two training. You do, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of bleed over. So these are not hard and fast, you know, adaptations where you only get improved fat burning in zone two. Well, you know, that's not really the case, but um, zone two is the best zone to go to for improving fat burning, for example. So. That's why we use the three zones that we do because we're targeting specific adaptations, but there's a lot of bleed over. Okay, and you get all of the adaptations that we listed in all of the zones that we talked about. It's just that some zones are better at those adaptations than others. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the three phases. We talked about our three tools. Now let's talk about our three phases. We're gonna keep this pretty simple. Okay, so our first phase is base. It's a base training period. And our base training period is super simple. All we're doing in our base training period is zone two running. That's it. No, no tempo, no track intervals, all zone two running in our base period. And we're staying in this heart rate zone, 72 to 82% uh, heart rate zone. And we're just accumulating miles in, in that uh, intensity zone. And we gradually want to increase the volume. And so the rule of thumb is to increase by about 10%, increase your mileage by about 10% a week during this uh, base period. And how long do you want to be in base? Well, as long as you can, really. I mean, some people stay in base literally for years without doing any tempo or interval training, and they continue to improve. And that's fine. Um, what I'll say about this is the longer you're in base, the bigger your improvements will be in build and peaking. Okay. Well, what about build? Well, we want to stay in build for about six to eight weeks. And build is pretty simple. It consists of using two different tools. In build, we're using zone two running and we're using zone four running. So it's going to be both, right? So we're going to have a combination of zone two running and zone four running. And I'll explain later how we put that together. But basically what we're doing in build is you know, we're continuing to do that zone two running, but then we add in some zone four running. We're gonna do that for six to eight weeks because the type of fitness you get in zone four tends to plateau after about six to eight weeks. Okay, and finally peaking. In peaking, we're gonna use all three of our tools. We're gonna have some zone two running, some zone four running, and some zone five running. So steady tempo and track intervals, all will be included in our peaking phase. And peaking is going to last three to four weeks because those zone five track intervals, the type of fitness we get there, tends to plateau after about three to four weeks. Okay. So let's look at how we put all this together. So we're going to talk about how we incorporate 
steady, which is zone two efforts, right? Tempo, which is zone four, and intervals, which is zone five in each of the phases. All right, so we'll start with bass. And again, bass is all steady paced running. That's it, you know. Uh, for, you know, for a good run training program, the ideal way to structure it is five workouts per week or more if you can handle more. It's hard to get a good periodized program with fewer runs than that, with less frequent running than that. But it can be done. So I'm going to use an example of five runs per week. So in base, if we're running five runs per week, basically each one's a steady paced run. That's basically it. Now they can all be equal length. That's fine. Or if you're training for a longer distance event, you know, maybe you'll pick one of those runs per week and slowly stretch it out as a longer and longer run, and that's fine too. Um, and in general, during your base period, you want to slowly ramp up your mileage by no more than 10% per week and stay in that heart rate zone. And that's all there is to it. That's base period. Really simple, okay? Now when it's time to shift to build, what we do is we take where we were at the end of our base period, we take out one of the steady runs, and we put in its place a tempo run. And we start with a fairly light dose of tempo. So, you know, our other runs would stay pretty much where they were during our base building period. And, and we can slowly increase them from there, although we might not want to increase quite as much as 10% per week during build, but we will probably want to creep them up a little bit. And then our, we, we substitute one steady run for a tempo run, or one tempo run for a steady run. And we start with a relatively light dose of tempo. So let's say we start with, you know, 15 minutes of tempo. So we might do three times five at uh, five minutes at tempo pace. And that's early on in build. Now, later on in build, we're going to make another substitution. Okay. So we continue to do our steady pace runs. We continue to do that tempo run that we, we were doing. And we try to increase the volume of tempo a bit. But we're going to take another steady run and we're going to replace it with a tempo run. So early on in build, we had one tempo run. Later on in build, we've got two tempo runs. Okay, but we're still running five days a week. So now we've increased our dose of tempo. And so I think you can see here, it's pretty easy. You know, we might go from um, early on in build having, say, 15 minutes of tempo per week, you know, and then later on in build, you know, we may be at, uh, I don't know, 40 minutes of tempo per week, you know, something like that. So the goal is over time in our build period to increase the amount of tempo we're doing while at least trying to keep our steady runs at the same distance, but increasing them slightly if we can. And that gives us a little bit of volume and intensity overload. Okay, now we go to peaking. And peaking just involves yet another substitution. And so we keep our two tempo runs pretty much where they were at the end of build. We keep our steady runs pretty much where they were at the end of build. But we take one of those other steady runs and we replace it with a track interval run, a single day of track interval runs. And now you can see what we have here. We've got two tempo runs one track interval run and the rest of our runs are steady. If you're running six days a week, you know, you would add a steady run. If you're running seven days a week, you would add a steady run. We're not going to add any more tempo and any more interval. Two tempo sessions per week and one interval session per week is all we want. We never want to do more than one interval session per week, not for, uh, not for sub elite athletes. And remember this interval session is done as half mile track intervals and we're using time to, to uh, track our our intensity. And that's really, that's the, um, that's it in a nutshell, how we organize the three tools, three phases approach to periodized training. It's really, really simple. You know, so to reiterate a couple of important points in base, we're just slowly increasing mileage. You know, we're using the 10% rule and we want to have at least a six week base period. More is better. Um, but we want to have at least a six week period if we can. Um, in build, early on in build, we replace one zone two run with a tempo run. And later on in build, we replace the second zone two run with a tempo run. So we end up with two tempo runs. Mm -hmm. 
and we just gradually increase the dose of tempo per week, the amount of minutes we spend per week in tempo. And you can just kind of plot that out over, you know, a six to eight week period, you know, that maybe I'll start with 10 minutes and by the end of that eight week period, I'll be at 40 minutes a week of tempo. And that's, that's a simple thing to uh, plot out in a spreadsheet. Okay. And then when we go to peaking, we simply replace a zone two run with a track interval session, just one. We always do just one track interval session. More of that's more, more of that, more than that is too hard to recover from. Track intervals are really potent medicine. Okay. And we start with a light dose and we progress towards a heavier dose. Remember we said a light dose is a mile total of interval pace and two miles is a really heavy dose. Well, the last thing we do, and I don't call this a training phase um, because you don't always taper. You probably would just be tapering for your important races and maybe just training through the rest of the races. You know, some races can count as a tempo uh, workout. If uh, let's say it's a 10K or a 5K, that, that could count as your tempo workout for the week. But for important races where you really want to perform your best, you want to taper. And what's a taper? Well, we just decrease the volume but keep a little bit of intensity. That's all. Um, so we taper for one to two weeks with uh, a large or moderate reduction in volume. We cut the total run mileage down, but we want to keep some of the intensity, but dial it down just a little bit. So, you know, if I was tapering for an important 10K race, um, I probably would do an easy, easy, shorter, steady run. I probably would do a little bit of a tempo effort run during that week, but I would, I would keep it at a really light dose. And I probably would do a couple of track intervals, but... Uh, you know, just take the edge off just a little bit. So I probably would have something like three runs that week that are way shorter, but a much lower volume overall. Something like that would tend to work pretty well. Um, we typically taper for about a week for the shorter races, but for a longer race like a marathon, we might taper for a full two weeks, depending on how much training we had leading up to the marathon. If we got a really heavy dose of training, we might need two weeks. So here's an important point I want to make because I don't want you to miss this point. It's really important. So the important point is stay in the zone. So I mentioned earlier, get yourself a heart rate monitor so that you can make sure you're staying in the zone during our uh, steady pace runs and our tempo pace runs. And so you might say, well, if I stay in the zone, how am I going to get any faster? Well, here's how you get faster. We're staying in a heart rate zone. With training, your heart rate at a given uh, speed is going to go down. So let's say this is a heart rate at constant speed here, okay? And let's say that constant speed is seven miles per hour. If we measure your heart rate at seven miles per hour while you're uh, going through a training program, here's what we might find. We might, might find initially that your heart rate was here, okay? But one month into training, your heart rate at seven miles per hour is less. Three months into training, your heart rate at seven miles per hour is even less. And so what does that mean? Well, you know, we're not training at a constant speed in our system. We're training at constant heart rate zones. So let's look at what that means here. Okay. So that same adaptation means that if I'm training at a constant, in a constant heart rate zone, let's say I'm, I'm training at uh, about, you know, 80% of my max heart rate. That means that initially my speed's going to be here. But one month into training, 80% of my max heart rate, the same heart rate, let's say 80% of my max heart rate is uh, a heart rate of uh, 150 beats per minute. So initially, my speed at 150 beats per minute is here. Well, after one month of training, my speed at 150 beats per minute is higher. After three months of training, my speed at 150 beats per minute is even higher. So this is pretty nice in effect. Um, and what's nice about this is it provides a natural means of progression and what some people call auto regulation. You go faster as your body adapts. You don't, you don't go faster until your body adapts by training with a, a, a target heart rate zone. So it provides a natural means of, prog of progress, of, of providing overload when your body's ready for it by staying in the target heart rate zone, as your body adapts and your heart rate response gets lower, you're gonna to have to go faster to stay in that target heart rate zone. So it's why I highly recommend a heart rate monitor. It'll, you know, it pretty much tells you when you're ready to go faster. All you do is you just stay in your target heart rate zone. So in the end, what you're doing is you're going faster at the same effort level. So the effort level is gonna feel the same. You're not 
trying to run harder, um, but you will be running faster at the same effort level. It's a nice way to do it. Get the heart rate monitor. Okay, so one more piece to clear up in our program and how we structure programs, and this is an important concept. So we talked about the three tools and the three phases that we use in our periodized program, and now I'm going to tell you something interesting. And that interesting thing is that we don't use all of those phases for every race distance. So let's look at how that stacks out. Okay, so let's look at an ultra marathon. So, you know, now we're talking about 50 milers, 100 mile races. These are done at a pretty slow pace because you're not going to run fast for 100 miles, right, or 50 miles. It's pretty slow pace. As a result, there's just not much in tempo runs and track intervals that are relevant for that race pace. And so what that means is that for ultra marathon, our whole training program involves just staying in base. We don't need any build or peaking at all. So basically for uh, ultra marathon training, all we're doing is zone two running. <clears throat> That's it. We don't need the other phases at all. Well, what about marathon? So, well, for marathon and non-elites, the same thing applies really. For marathon for non-elites, we're best pretty much just staying in base. We don't need to do any hard running at all. In fact, any hard running that you do during marathon training is just taking away recovery energy that you could have used to run more mileage because you know total mileage is what's most important for completing a marathon fast. You're not gonna run one step of that marathon at tempo pace. That's not necessarily true for elites, but for non-elites, the smartest marathon training program is simply staying in base and extending your training mileage. That's it. Well, for half marathon, now it starts to make sense to have a little bit of a build period for a half marathon. Probably not a full, you know, six to eight week build period. You might add about two weeks of build in there and just get a couple of, you know, tempo interval sessions in just to sharpen things up a little bit. But the vast majority of your training is still going to be based. But a small build period makes some sense for a half marathon race. Well, for a 10K, you know, you probably want a full build. Uh, you want to, you know, you want base, you want a full build, you know, six to eight, eight weeks of build and at least some peaking, at least a couple of weeks of peaking for uh, a 10K race. Um, you may not necessarily want to do three to five weeks of peaking. You may just want to do a couple of weeks um, and that would be fine. But we would use all three phases for a 10K. And for a 5K, we want a full build, a full base, a full build, and full peaking. And the same thing for a race like a mile or a mile and a half. We want a full build, a full, full base, full build, and full peaking. So this is that same information and a little bit of a summary, you know, and I'm not going to go through it in detail again, but, you know, basically ultra marathon base taper and then race, you know, and then, uh, you know, when we get up here for a mile, we're using all three phases. Okay. And so that's really simple. So the three tools, three phases approach works for every race distance. We just eliminate some of the phases for some race distances. Okay, let's try to clarify things with an example. This is an example of an eight month periodized cycle for a 10K race. So somebody's got a really important 10K race they wanna do in eight months and they wanna know, how do I do this optimally, you know? And this is, this is not an elite athlete, this is somebody who hasn't done a lot of running. Okay, so let's look at what we have. So we have phases, uh, at, the, we have phases at the top and we have time, uh, time frame up here, okay? Um, we have our tools um, here. We have steady tempo and VO2 max intervals. And then we have mileage or time here. If it's a number, uh, it's mileage. If it's, uh, you know, if it looks like a time like, like this, it's, uh, it's a time, okay? So let's start with early base. Phase one or early base, okay? So, you know, we, we, all we're doing is steady pace running. And we might level load it, you know, that's fine. Um, in fact, we tend to recover better with a level loaded dose than if we, uh, if we stack a lot of dose in one workout. So level loading, it makes sense. 
Remember in base, what we're doing is we're just increasing the volume of steady pace running over time. And so later in base, you know, now, um, you know, all of our runs are longer basically. So we're accumulating a lot more mileage than we were early on. Okay, so we've gone from, uh, you know, um, uh, 12 miles a week to 24 miles a week. We've doubled our mileage. Okay, and then suddenly we hit our uh, build period. In here, early build, in early build, we put in one tempo run. So we replace one steady run with a tempo run, and we start with a moderate dose of tempo. So 20 minutes, that could be four times five minutes or two times 10 minutes. Later on in base, I mean in uh, build, later on in build, part two of build, we add in a second tempo run. Okay, so we replace this, an, another steady run with a tempo run. So early on, you know, we were at 20 minutes a week of tempo. Later on, here we are at 50 minutes a week of tempo, okay? <clears throat> and you can see how much time has elapsed. So two months, two months, one month, one month. Okay, now we're gonna get into peaking. And so we keep our tempo workouts. Okay, we've got a steady pace run in here, which we've bumped up in distance a little bit. And now we're doing some quarter mile track intervals. So maybe eight times quarter mile track intervals in here. Okay. And that's in our third phase peaking. Then maybe we do a little bit of a taper and we go and race. So what we have here is we have a base of 16 weeks, a build of eight weeks and peaking for about six weeks. And you know, those numbers can change it. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, 16, eight and six. Those are just approximations. Well, let's discuss some common questions that I often get. Do I have to spend the full time in each zone? You know, so I said, for example, build six to eight weeks. Do I have to spend six to eight weeks in build? Do I have to spend three to five weeks in peaking? Do I have to spend, you know, two, three, four, five months in base? And the answer is real. Well, really, no. You don't have to spend the full time in each zone. You know, what if, for example, let's say. Um, and I've done a lot of this type of training. I'm, I'm training somebody in the Navy for the mile and a half PRT run, and we have six weeks to go. And they're going from very little running to the PRT in six weeks. Well, what's the most relevant phase for a mile and a half PRT? Well, it's peaking, right? Because we're including VO2 max intervals, which are gonna be run at about PRT pace. And so what I might do in that case is, I might do a couple of weeks of build you know, and then maybe four weeks of peaking because I want to make sure I include as much of the most relevant phase as possible. You know, what if I'm training somebody for a 10K race and they've got, you know, eight or nine weeks? Well, you know, I probably want to include a full build because we are including tempo intervals in the build phase and that's done at 10K race pace. And so, you know, I probably would do a bit of base and a full build period in that case if I just had limited time. So, you know, the time you spend in each zone just depends on what time you have available and you prioritize. That's how you do it. Now, if I've got all year to train, well, then I want a full build, a full base and a full peaking depending on my race distance. Remember, you know, if we're training for a marathon, we're not going to really do any build or peaking anyway. Well, here's another question. What if I'm not training for a specific race? I want to perform well and I want to periodically race. You know, I don't know, maybe one, maybe this year I'll race a marathon, but I'd like to do some 5Ks and 10Ks and maybe even a mile race or an obstacle course race. So I don't have any specific plans on when I'm going to do these races. I just know I'm going to do them and I want to be ready in case I decide, you know, that, oh, hey, that 5K looks fun next week. I'm going to go do it. How do I organize my training then? Well, the smart way to do it is to still get most of your training in zone two with a sprinkling of zone four and zone five in there. So if I were that person, I probably, you know, if I'm running five days a week, I probably would have uh, three of those runs as steady pace runs and maybe one tempo run and one interval run in there. So I get a sprinkling of all of it, but with the majority of my running still being zone two running. And why would I do that? Well, because I'm doing the majority of my running in a zone whose, whose benefits don't plateau for years and years and years. And that's the way to keep improving as a runner is to do most of your running in zone two.
Well, I think I answered the question, what if I only have six weeks to train? And, uh, you know, another question I get sometimes is, can I just do hard intervals all the time? Why not just do hard intervals all the time? Because they're real potent medicine. And I think I explained that a little bit, you know, because the benefits that you get, the adaptations that you get from hard intervals, they plateau pretty quickly. So you would improve and then you would stop improving. And how much mileage is too much? I think I talked about a little bit when I talked about training mileage zone two, that beyond 60 miles a week, you know, there's a point of diminishing returns. You continue to get improvement, but not a whole lot. So I think for most non-elites, you know, 60 miles a week is probably a top end cap, unless you want to really, really get serious about uh, maybe racing for a living. So I have a tool for you on my website. Uh, it's really simple. It's basically this entire system, the the three tools, three phases approach in a one pager with basically three steps, you know, designing a training program in three steps. It walks you through it. So it's kind of a, a flow chart and this is what it looks like. So if you go to my web page, um, you can find that pretty easily if you navigate around a little um, in the other training program section and also in the blog. If you uh, go back a few blogs, you'll find it. Um, so I think that'll be a nice tool for you after having watched the video, you should be able to look at that one pager and put it together pretty quickly. Well, that's it, folks. That's the three tools, three phases approach to run training. It, you know, this also works for all endurance sports, for cycling, for, you know, cross country skiing, whatever, whatever you have in terms of an endurance sport, the same approach is going to work because it's basic periodized training. So um, there are much more complicated training programs out there, but you know, again, training programs don't have to be complicated to be effective. And sometimes the more complicated they are, the less effective they are. And there's a lot of training programs out there that are using tools that are not appropriate to the race distance. That, and that just doesn't make much sense. And there are also a lot of training programs out there that are using um, programs designed for elite athletes and trying to apply them to non-elites. And that doesn't make sense either. I think this basic approach you know, makes a lot of sense. And uh, I've used this with great success with a, um, quite a few uh, runners in the Navy and outside of the Navy. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned a little bit. As always, if you have questions, head over to my site and submit a comment or shoot me an email and I'll be happy to answer it for you. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation and learned something, please spread the word. Thanks for listening.